Hey, it's Mike here, and today, did meat actually make us human? A very recent study that looked at ancient diets during a critical period of brain development and growth in human history has the researchers calling their own results, quote, a big surprise that really challenges the meat made us human narrative. So we're gonna learn about that study as well as something I haven't really seen around this study, which is a good amount of context around like what ancestor was living at that time. So we're gonna sort of meet one. How much did brains actually grow during this period? And on and on, this stuff is super interesting to me. So let's just go. And by let's go, I mean, there's a quick update. It looks like I'm going to be doing a vegan trip to Iceland on July 22nd, which is awesomely right after the UK vegan camp out that I'm going to. We should have spots available for reservation in the next week or so, but you can click the link below to stay in the loop on that if you want to. Anyway, let's get into it. I don't need to spend a bunch of time on the meat made us human hypothesis, but it's really just the notion that our brains grew a lot to the point where we became what we are now, human. And so we need an explanation for that. And there are really only two majorly accepted explanations for that. One, that it was eating more meat, and two, aliens. I'm kidding, I'm not gonna talk about aliens. And really there are a lot of theories and a bunch of contributing factors. I just wanted to say too, to make that joke. And this has been in the popular media, even on YouTube. I responded to Seeker's video where they several times said meat made us human as if it was a fact. Without it, we would not be the majestic and gangly humans that we currently are. And I responded to that, I'll link it below. But from this article, the lead author, Andrew Barr of George Washington University says, quote, generations of paleoanthropologists have gone to famously well-preserved sites in places like Old Duvai Gorge looking for and finding breathtaking direct evidence of early humans eating meat, furthering this viewpoint that there was an explosion of meat eating after two million years ago. And I would add that it's really difficult to figure out like the percentage of animal versus plants that were eaten from bones alone because bones survive and plant matter generally doesn't. I mean, a bone versus a kale stem, the bone is gonna last. And so you can just be eating one boar as a tribe once a year, that would be 230 bones. You do that for a hundred years at a site, you're talking about 20,000 bones, eat plants all day, every day, zero kale stems left. But according to the meat made us human hypothesis, you would have to see an increase in meat eating in order to have that increase in brain size. And so you have to look at bones over time at these different sites. And that's exactly what the study did. So let's get to it. It is this one hot off the press in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. They basically opened by saying the use of animal bones to support the meat made us human hypothesis hasn't really been scrutinized in detail on a larger scale. And they set off doing this. I don't think they did it to prove anything either way, as we'll get to. But they went ahead and they looked at a bunch of archeological sites across Africa and looked at, was there actually an increase in these animal bones? Or as they call it, residual evidence for carnivory. Fancy schmancy scientists. There's just so much stuff that they just pointlessly use words that are fancier than they need to be. I mean, zooarchaeological assemblages. Bro, just say animal bones. And to get some context here, we need to look at the timeline and who was around then. And they say that, quote, we present a quantitative synthesis of the zooarchaeological record of Eastern Africa from 2.6 to 1.2 million years ago. And a quick reminder that modern humans, AKA Homo sapiens, seem to emerged around 300,000 years ago. So this is significantly further back than that. However, looking to this chart on brain growth over time, we can see that there was a serious amount of brain growth during that period from about a chimpanzee's brain going most of the way to a modern human. And Homo erectus is one of the species they're talking about during this time period. And they're really interesting. I wanna focus a little bit on them because they really were early prehistoric humans, obviously not modern humans, they were different, but they walked upright very efficiently and they reached like six feet tall. So they're not like little hunched over ape guys running around. You know, you can see from this illustration that they're quite human looking. Of course it is an illustration and it is worth mentioning that they do span beyond that time period of over a million years ago. However, if we're looking to a Homo erectus, from say 1.4 million years ago, we can look to the Tarkana boy here. You know, he looks very human. I feel like if you just put him in modern clothes and saw him on the street, you'd be like, he looks a little bit different, but obviously he's still a human. And the artistic depiction of him honestly is incredible. However, some other artists have sort of failed to depict Homo erectus accurately. So <laughs> just this one, which is basically just Clint Eastwood after losing a fight. We all have it coming. 
Tarkana kid. And while it's a bit of a tangent, no, it is very unlikely that Homo erectus' skin was Clint Eastwood white, that white. I mean, yeah, they were mostly probably dark skinned except for a little bit lighter as they moved into like Eastern Asia, but no. And in terms of brain size, looking to the charts, you can start to see a pretty good overlap between the upper end of Homo erectus and the lower end of us Homo sapiens. Part of that could be because they were pretty tall up at potentially six feet tall in some cases, but brain to body ratio, which is really important. Even some samples past 1.2 million years ago could have fit within that range of modern humans brain to body size. I could talk about Homo erectus forever, but the point here is that this is in fact a time period. We went from basically like chimpanzee brains to where we became human more or less. Obviously we went further than that, but this is key in terms of time. All right, now to those darned results. Don't need to hold you back any longer. Back to this article, the lead author says that after all the data was analyzed, yes, that meat made us human narrative starts to unravel. Echoed directly from the study with quote, our study demonstrates that the temporal or time pattern in the amount of evidence of hominin carnivory from 2.6 to 1.2 million years ago is essentially flat with no sustained increase through time. And here is one of those charts showing that essentially flat lined evidence of carnivory through the record there. It should be going up sort of like a slope with our brain size, as you can see from those charts. Nope, doesn't. And another important part about doing science is where you get your sample from and how your sample is collected. And that can get us into sampling bias. A simple and perfect example of this is, let's say I'm trying to be rated on a scale of one to 10 in terms of hotness. If I say, go to a gay bar, they're gonna be like, you're an eight. But if I ask anybody else, like a bunch of women, they're gonna be like, oh, six and a half. And that's important here because the study took into account something that hadn't been done here before, and that was sampling effort, their way of looking at sampling bias in this context. In this case, there seem to be multiple forces driving scientists to take way more samples at the newer sites. First of which is that they are more well-preserved. They can get those nice samples that look great with little cut marks and stuff on them. And another might just come down to straight up bias about the actual meat made us human theory. They might go, oh, this is the time period that we needed to eat a lot of meat to sustain our brains. Let's dig twice as much area in this site than we did in the older site. And boom, you end up with twice as many bones. As the lead author Barr says, after Homo erectus, there's been a lot of intensive research activity on finding these smoking guns of human carnivory, whereas prior, there's less research effort. Our study shows that it is influencing how much evidence is available. And as Science Daily put it, this skews the evidence in favor of the meat made us human hypothesis. So they then determine how many more bones are found when you are looking more. They then corrected for that. And the result, quote, our synthesis of the Eastern African zooarchaeological record makes clear that sampling effort constrains the zooarchaeological visibility of hominin carnivory. If you go looking for bones, you're gonna find some more bones. Anyway, beyond sampling bias, could there perhaps have been some anti-meat bias? We always have to ask these questions. And it does not appear that there was some secret sleeper cell of vegans that became archeologists and then made this study. No, it's from a wide variety of researchers from around the world. And one quote in particular sort of shows that they weren't probably trying to do this from co-author Brianna Pobiner of the Smithsonian quote, I've excavated and studied cut marked fossils for over 20 years and our findings were still a big surprise to me. Of course, this study is massively sensational and groundbreaking on meat's smaller role in brain evolution. So it received a whopping reception of Zero shares on I effing love science a few days ago when I looked at it. People love to have more reasons to eat high fat animal foods. So of course they've supported positive pieces toward this notion in the past, this one, not so much, but let's look to the dietary implications. So should people keep using the meat brain excuse as a reason to shove down animal products three plus times a day? Well, to Barr, again, the lead researcher, quote, I would think this study and its findings would be of interest, not just to the paleoanthropology community, but to all the people currently basing their dietary decisions around some version of this meat eating narrative, our study undermines the idea that eating large quantities of meat drove evolutionary changes in our early ancestors. So if you've watched my channel before, you might have a big alarm going off in your head. I'm sure it's happening in the comments that this is all an appeal to nature. 
that trying to do what happened in nature isn't automatically right. Simple example, if eating our own poop was a big part of making us human, should you keep eating your own poop? Also smearing it on your face, that was a huge part. So from an ethical perspective or a health perspective, eating what is best is not necessarily what we did eat. And it is worth mentioning that higher meat consumption is associated with a lot of diseases that I talk about literally all the time on my channel. I mean, red meat, which would have been a huge portion of the meat that would have been available to our ancestors. Yeah, apparently class 2A carcinogen, so. Either way, I still find it interesting to see what forces drove our evolution and of course, what excuses people try to use and why they shouldn't use them. But this brings me to perhaps what did usher in that brain growth. And you already know, cause I'm obsessed with it. And it is cooked starch. Of course, we don't know anything for sure, but this is what I believe is the main driver just because cooking increases the bioavailability, more calories from starches. There's so many reasons that starches support brain function and growth and fuel. It basically has chains of glucose and our body burns 20 to 25% of our fuel in our brain. And this brings us to the more relevant question, was there even fire during this period where we even cooking, could starch have even been cooked? Could meat have been cooked? The study says, quote, the novel characteristics of Homo erectus may instead be related to other factors besides carnivory. Some researchers have suggested that the provisioning of plant foods by grandmothers or the development of novel food methods of food preparation using fire may have contributed to the evolution of the modern human-like features of Homo erectus, but then they caution. And there's just a lot of debate about when fire started being fully controlled and utilized. And when we have researchers like Richard Wrangham, who says it was nearly 2 million years ago that we started controlling fire. That is why all of this happened. And that's, you know, reasonably compelling. Although a lot of people say there's not enough archeological evidence for that. Did we have control? We don't have the smoking gun of like the little twigs with the holes in them, fire starters. So others say it was probably more a piecemeal where we were harnessing some wildfires, maybe keeping them going for a bit or even doing foraging after wildfires. You see those cooked tubers, you pick them up, you eat them, they're more bioavailable. There are a couple more reasons meat doesn't fit as well. When you cook it, yeah, you get some benefits, but it's not massively increasing the amount of calories that are in it. We're also talking about wild game, which is just this proteiny, sinewy meat, as opposed to the higher calorie, higher fat content of supermarket meat that is overfed, for example. And of course, that means you're gonna get bad quality brain food, transferring protein calories into brain fuel is really bad. This study put that to the test perfectly by giving men a high protein diet of eggs, bacon, chicken, etc., and found that during gluconeogenesis, now creating glucose from that meat, 33% of energy was lost. Horrible strategy for brain evolution. And I know low carbers, probably the one or two of them that are listening to this, maybe my hate subscribers that instantly dislike the video, which I can't see anymore. <laughs> Screw you. Uh, they're gonna be screaming ketosis. It was the natural state. I've gone through that a ton of times, but just in terms of how all human populations around the world, even the Inuit, do not go into ketosis, and then our primate ancestors not going into ketosis. That is just such a ridiculous theory. Animal fat did not fuel our brain enough to grow it. It chooses to burn glucose over fat for a reason. Also, if meat makes you so smart, why aren't lions the smartest animal in the world? I know that's a limited argument, but I had to throw it out there. It's a supporting point. The starch hypothesis is also supported by Karen Hardy and her team. They have a couple good papers on it. Quote, we provide evidence that cooked starch, a source of preformed glucose, greatly increased energy availability to human tissues with high glucose demands, such as the brain, red blood cells, and the developing fetus. And we also have this pretty recent 2021 study that I mentioned talking about the genome sequencing of bacteria that is associated with starch in the dental biofilm. That goes back at least 600,000 years ago. So that's a hint that it went back even further. Anyway, I have more videos on starch and archeology span and brain stuff, and I'll try to link them all below. But in the end, I think it was said pretty well by that lead researcher Barr, quote, the idea that there was a sudden evolutionary event where meat eating went from being relatively unimportant to being so central that it drove the evolution of key human traits just doesn't shake out in our analysis of the published evidence. It does not shake out. There was no steak and shake for Homo erectus. And finally, I have to reiterate that this was a key time in human brain evolution from basically being chimpanzees to being something that looked and acted probably a lot like a human and we consider 
prehistoric humans. So finally, for the meat made as human hypothesis, it appears that it has been a no bones day. You have to watch TikTok to know what that means. But that was a thing two months ago, so that's like four years in TikTok time. Anyway, feel free to check out that link below if you're interested in keeping track of this Iceland trip, which I'm super excited about. And let me know down below what you think about all of these theories, hypotheses, findings, bones, meat, brains, all of that. And uh, thanks for watching. Feel free to like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.